We're going to be talking about an impression that exists where Islam, its religious scholars, media experts, or politicians are all innately angry, as if the religion itself drives such behavior. Uh, Islamic rage did not go away. In fact, in some ways, it's more dangerous. We'll reveal to you the real reasons behind this tangible irritation while also debunking the mainstream false narrative and impression of Islam as a faith that promotes rage. When attending Friday prayers with my father as a young boy in the beautiful mosques of Cairo, I couldn't help but think, even at that young age, why was the speaker delivering the weekly Friday sermon with so much anger, disturbingly animated and loud, as if we had all done something wrong and blasphemous? Even my dad seemed to be in trouble. Why was the speaker telling off everybody in the mosque? Subsequently, and in the many Muslim countries I went on to live in or visit, the same anger emanated from religious scholars' sermons, blasting into the vast cityscapes of Arab capitals via the loudspeakers on the minaret tops, with all sorts of stress, tension, and anxiety. The false narrative I spoke about has a plain premise. All Muslims are angry. Theirs is a religion that promotes rage and uncivility that is more conducive of middle-age mentalities, of an ignorance and a predisposition to improper reaction and ultimately violence in the name of the faith. This narrative has unfortunately been fed well by Muslims themselves, by leaders both those who are in government or who are in religion, offering triggered speeches and quotes that are uncontrollably emotional, an easy prey for those seeking headlines incriminating the faith by the words of its own believers, fed also by the rough Muslim mobs that coincidentally appear in large hordes every instant an insignificant provocation towards the faith rises to the surface, further pushing the image of a Muslim society that has yet to come to terms with freedoms and rights of the more civilized nations. The Western media is quite smart in how it orchestrates these stereotypes in portraying such a natural state of anger within the Islamic world, sourcing Muslim experts and panel members that represent a damning impression of the faith and the mentalities of its supposed leadership and thinkers, feeding the falsehoods that this faith and religion is one to be feared, as are its people. From the standpoint of Muslims, of course, there are things to be angry about. Muslims are still angry at their past sufferings with imperialism and how the West came to colonize and suppress Muslim nations for their political games and natural resources. Another version of imperialism that seems to have taken on a life of its own today is the invasion and imposition of Western ideas and beliefs. Western ideals that contradict the fundamental identity of Muslims. Demonizing Sharia, introducing secularism not only in separating government and religion, but also in reducing social conservatism and traditions by labeling them as reflections of ignorance. And finally, in the attempts to humiliate the Islamic faith by those who claim freedom of speech or expression. Anger exists at Western injustices and military interventions across the Muslim world, like in Palestine early in the 20th century, Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan at the beginning of the 21st. Millions killed with no reason, promises made to the Muslims since the Great War only for them to be abandoned at the behest of another colonizer or a foreign occupier. Anger at the reality that the believers of Islam are under the control and submissive to those who are more powerful, the non-believers. All of what I have just listed justifies some level of anger, a fairly high level, I might add. So maybe the question isn't, why are Muslims angry? As there's a lot to be angry about. But maybe the question should be replaced with this one. Does Islam condition Muslims to becoming angry? This last question is actually quite ludicrous. Islam and anger are like the opposite polarities of a magnet. Islam rejects anger. Throughout its references, the Qur'an or the Hadiths, anger is frowned upon with no room for jurisprudence on the matter. It's a fairly straightforward position. In Surah Al-Imran, Ayah 133 and 134, Allah states, Those who spend in prosperity and in adversity, who repress anger and who pardon men, verily Allah loves Al-Muhsinun, the good doers. In Surah Ashura, Ayah 37, Allah is defining those who He puts His trust in, who avoid major sins and shameful deeds, and forgive when angered. In one of the many hadiths concerning anger, a man said to the Prophet, Advise me. The Prophet said, 
do not get angry. The man repeatedly made the same request, and the prophet answered each time with, do not get angry. Another hadith by the prophet relayed by Abu Hurairah tells, the strong is not the one who overcomes the people by his strength, but the strong is the one who controls himself while in anger. Many, many more examples within Muslim scripture can be listed that portray the same dissatisfaction the faith has with anger and its consequences. Islam, as we all know, reflects not only the structures of our relationship with the divine, but it also is a code for living the worldly life. And in this case, Islam presents a full crash course on anger management. But unfortunately, in our modern era, as may be also the case within eras of antiquity, politics and consolidation of power within Muslim nations trump everything else, even in following the guidance of the Prophet. Anger is abused by political and religious leaders as an instrument in dispensing chaos and fear, in choosing and utilizing anger as a response to any sentiment of victimhood, over that of a reaction that could be much more mature, balanced, and well-grounded with cognitive analysis and discourse. You have started a war with the Muslims, and we will not live or die until we become victorious in this war. Muslim governments, in the hope of distracting its struggling populations, find in anger a solution, thereby peddling the traditional conspiracy that the West has it in for Muslims. And the only way Islam can grit its teeth is by mustering up the anger of the mob, either through its own proxies or via the clandestine instructions of the religious extremist establishment. all the while instilling fear and hence keeping the Muslim majorities and masses who aren't so wildly impulsive and are more aligned with Islam's principle of reason on the back foot. And who exactly are the mob who represent Muslims to the West? They're the poor, the needy, the easily impressionable who can quickly be swayed by an elementary rally cry and who most probably have never experienced firsthand any of the insults meant for the faith. the satanic verses. They bought it not to read, but to burn. For example, in 1988, Selman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, was published in the United Kingdom. The verses was loosely based on the life of the prophet, but included elements of blasphemy. It was nominated for the Booker Prize, one of literature's top prizes at the end of the same year. No reaction came from any Muslim, not one. It was only upon the book being published in the United States some five months later did it get the attention of the Iranian mob as well as that of the Ayatollah Khomeini, hence issuing his fatwa calling for the death of Rushdie. Iran, just so that you know, in parallel, was dealing with a devastated economy following the eight-year Iran-Iraq war. Violent anti-American protests have spread to another Middle Eastern country and city two days after the American ambassador to Libya and three of his staff were killed. In 2012, a poorly made YouTube video named The Innocence of Muslims caused all sorts of commotion. Without going into too much detail about the video, its main intention was to denigrate the Prophet and the faith. Subsequently, across the Muslim world, riots and rallies calling for the death of all who were involved with the production took place. Although blocked in many Muslim nations, the video still caused severe anger and rage. The mobs took shape, and as an example of the outbursts, in Pakistan, a crowd of 15,000 torched six cinemas, three Hindu temples, two banks, a post office, and five police vehicles, while murdering two police officers. And these two instances are amongst many, many others. It's the actions of Muslims that bring attention to the weak and insignificant insults. protesters picketing screenings of The Lady of Heaven, ensuring it is one of the most talked about films out now. It is the actions of Muslims triggered by what seem to be irrelevant and childish insults that bring the image of the faith towards the domain of the negative, where the outcome is far greater than the perpetration. Insults to Islam are a key element in this whole discussion. It is an insult to burn a Quran. It's an insult to misrepresent the Prophet and his actions. Other faiths might take it on the chin, but for Islam, it's a red line. It's also an insult to stereotype Muslims and dehumanize them, 
to be so openly, inexplicably and hypocritically unjust. But at the same time, Muslims need not show outburst upon the triggering of our sentiments. Our actions should be much more weighed and measured. Not because we don't mind the offense, but because we can be much more effective in relaying our reaction without emotional eruptions. And in that way, what we have to say will be more easily heard and then possibly accepted. The same way in which the Prophet would have acted. Muslim conservatism is a strength. This conservatism shouldn't solely apply to that of our modesty or with our determination to upkeep tradition and identity, but it should also apply to how we engage with our emotions, especially the negative ones, like anger. And once we truly represent the guidance of the Prophet when it comes to anger and its consequences, we'll be in a much more powerful position to state our discontent and disapproval of all the insults cast onto us.